Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to everybody um, to the webinar today, and happy peer review peer review week to everybody. Um, just a couple of notices to start with. Firstly, um, I have just started recording the session, so please bear that in mind um, when you're making contributions later. Um, and can you please put yourselves on mute um, when uh, during the presentation so we can hear them uh, clearly? So. To start things off, today we'll be discussing the importance of standards in building trust in peer review, which of course is this year's theme for Peer Review Week, and looking at best practice for all stakeholders in scholarly communications. Um, the webinar today is being co-hosted by NISO and Cabells, and both standards and peer review are of course very close to our hearts. So for the running order today, first we got Veronique Kiemer from PLOS, who will be talking about NISO. We're then going to have um, Alison McGonagall O'Connell, who's going to talk to us about uh, the credit initiative. Then we have Melissa Harrison from eLife, who's going to talk to us about JATS 4R. And finally, we've got Tony Alves from Aries Systems, who's going to talk to us about the Mecca initiative. We're hoping to have each uh, contribution about 10 minutes each which will give us around another 10 minutes or so at the end for an opportunity to have um, a Q&A. And for the Q&A, please can you use the, the chat function um, at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen there? Um, can you put your questions on chat? I'll be making a note of those throughout the presentations um, and we will, I'll pick some of the questions for the end and hopefully we'll have some good questions that we can go through. So firstly, I'd like to ask Veronique if she can share her screen and she'll take you through her slides on NISO. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. Um, and I um, so I'm Veronique Kirmer. I'm uh, the Chief Scientific Officer at PLOS. Um, and I'm really happy to be here this morning. Um, by, by way of disclosure, I just want to mention that uh, I was previously employed by Nature that uh, I have been involved in the development and implementation of the credit taxonomy that you are going to hear about later. Uh, and I also currently serve on uh, the board of directors of ORCID, uh, as well as on the steering committee of uh, pre-review. Um, so these relevant disclosures um, aside, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this session. And I'm going to try to give you a little bit of uh, context about why the theme of Peer Review Week uh, this year uh, is, couldn't be actually more important or, or more timely. Um, why is it so important to actually trust uh, in peer review? Um, well, first and foremost, I think that um, peer review is actually central to um, how researchers um, make judgments about uh, what to trust, uh, what uh, papers to and scientific findings to read, to cite, to engage with, and to use in their own research. Um, I cite for this the, uh, the work of uh, David Nicholas and, and Carol Tenopier, and I encourage you to, to read their work. In this particular paper they published in 2014, they actually called peer review uh, the central pillar of, of trust. And, and this notion um, of this familiar notion to researchers that uh, work that has been peer reviewed has been actually um, examined and, and vetted by, um, by other scholars and that that gives it trust is actually extends to um, trust in, uh, in, in, in the general public. Um, this is an excerpt from a Pew Research Center survey um, that was conducted in 2019. And the second row of the results there show you that 52% um, of um, American respondents to this survey uh, trust scientific um, fi research findings when they hear that they have been reviewed by an independent committee. Now, this notion of, of trust um, uh, in, by, through the validation by, by other scholars has been uh, thrown in, in, in sharp relief by the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and that's the timeliness, I think, of this, of this discussion because this um, pandemic has also highlighted some of the challenges that, that, we, um, that we see in peer review. Um, 
first, uh, the, um, the need for speed in dissemination of, of uh, results about the coronavirus has um, encouraged um, uh, researchers uh, under this feeling of urgency to really um, make more use of, of uh, preprint servers, for example. We've seen um, a, a very um, uptick of, of the use of uh, preprint servers such as BioArchive and MedArchive. And, um, and, and while that has been incredibly important for the rapid dissemination of results, um, this article in the New York Times back in April, for example, um, reported concerns about the fact that some of the um, information that is shared um, uh, without the, the traditional format and, and framework of, of journal peer review um, that, that is used by people to, to establish trust, that that creates new challenges to understand what to, tr to, what to trust. And, and in particular, um, they cited the, the case of an, an article that was uh, post on by, posted on BioArchive and, um, and then used and amplified in, in the, on social media and, and through actually conspiracy theory websites um, to, 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 to basically um, uh, give more credibility to, to misinformation. Now that was a, a problem in terms of communication. From the scientific perspective, I actually think that the process worked incredibly well in that case. Um, within 48 hours of that paper having been posted on BioArchive, there were um, thorough, detailed critique by a specialist in the field who pointed to uh, the, the methodological issues and, uh, of the papers, pointed some of the flaws in the data, and, and basically concluded that, that the data was, that the results in conclusions were, were overstated. And, and to their credit, the, the researchers <clears throat> who had posted this paper realized that and decided to withdraw, withdraw the paper within 48 hours. So, so we see there a very effective peer review process that happens within 48 hours because these results are really impactful and really important. Um, but it happens outside of this uh, traditional format that we know about, about journal peer review. Now, meanwhile, um, journals have been struggling with the same issues of, of um, peer reviewing very large amounts uh, of, of results uh, that are done under, you know, studies that are done into, in very difficult conditions and that have to be reviewed incredibly rapidly. So the, the traditional um, uh, pre-publication uh, process has actually hit its own challenges as well. So, um, for example, in... Um, on May 22nd, uh, the Lancet published what was supposed to be the first authoritative study on, on the efficacy of chloroquine. And um, the 4th of June, so two weeks later, they actually retracted the paper following reactions from, from researchers and scientists in the field who had scrutinized the paper, pointed out at discrepancies, um, uh, what seemed like discrepancies in the data, and asked to see the data. And it turns out that um, the data actually was not available for, for scrutiny, not to readers, not to the journal um, editors or uh, an independent third party, and, and not to cert some of the co-authors of the paper. And as a result of that, the, the Lancet made the right decision to, to retract this paper. Now, meanwhile, that has had um, a really important impact in, in real life, including the pause of some clinical trials of chloroquine that were, that were underway at the time. On the same day, um, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, retracted another study that had to do with the, um, the safety of um, blood pressure medication for COVID patients. And, um, and this study was uh, based on data from the same company and, and retracted for the same reason, data was not available. Now, a week later after these retractions, PNAS published um, this, this study that concluded that the um, uh, the, the use of face covering was the determinant in the trends of, uh, of the pandemic, in trends of infection. And, and, and within two weeks, uh, 45 uh, researchers had signed uh, a letter to PNAS asking for this paper to be withdrawn because the conclusions were, were overblown and they point to methodological issues with, with the paper. So, so let's be clear about this. It, this does not mean that the conclusions of these papers are wrong. It means that the researchers who did these studies under these conditions and, and the data that is available to back up these conclusions does not allow to actually draw these conclusions. Now that's 
you know, it's very important because it has really um, uh, direct implications on policy making, on, on health care and, and on, on patient care. And so I think there is a real, there is a real um, issue there. There is also a real issue about the, the problem of trust in peer review that this, that this is bringing. Um, and to, to those of us, that are, and, and I'm sure all of you in, in, in the audience who are, who are familiar with peer review, this doesn't come as a complete surprise because we know there are well-documented challenges to, to peer review. Um, and these are, this is my list of top four challenges. I mean, the first one being the lack of transparency. At the moment, it's really difficult in most cases to say what was and what wasn't scrutinized during peer review. Um, and then it extends to the lack of transparency of some of the, of the papers where the data is not available to, that underpins the conclusion is not available to verify these conclusions. There are also issues around speed and delays and, and, and what I call unnecessarily delays here is not uh, really the delays that are due to, um, uh, to the process of peer review, but the fact that um, peer review is very often uh, done in the context of a particular journal and, and as such, there are very important, um, uh, the, the suitability for publication is very often based on, on, criteria, on subjective criteria that are specific to that journal, which means that some robust studies might be rejected um, because they don't fulfill those, those suitability criteria. They are resubmitted to another journal where in general they are re-reviewed and, and that creates this repetition of review, creates enormous delays and creates burden on, on the research community that, that, that does this peer review. And finally, I think it's very important to also consider some systemic biases in, the, in, in, in our, our system of peer review. And I would refer to uh, the, 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 the paper by Murray et al uh, that actually documents some, some gender um, issues. Now, these are addressable challenges, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to argue that there are here four potential remedies uh, to really tackle these challenges. The first one is transparency. Uh, we need to publish peer review so that actually readers can understand what was and what wasn't scrutinized during pre-publication peer review. And we need to make all the data underpinning the conclusions of papers available so that that, that scrutiny is, is, is possible. We have to move away from this peer review really, really tight to a certain journal and facilitate reviews transfers between journals, between publishers, and between some of the journal independent services that we've seen surfacing, such as uh, review comments, for example. In order to tackle the, the, the biases in the system, it's really incredibly important to, um, to increase the diversity of the reviewer pool. And, and at, you know, at the end of the day, making sure that reviewers are engaged and do the best work uh, uh, in this fundamental activity, we have to make peer review a first class academic output. People need to be rewarded and recognized for the time and the effort that they put into uh, this really important service. And this is where the really robust infrastructure underpinning all our systems is really important. Um, I would argue that it's incredibly important to have better systems for publishing peer review in journals. Um, at PLOS, we've implemented peer review, um, uh, the, the publication of peer review history in 2019. We've published more than, um, we have had more than 6,000 authors opting into that. It took us about nine months to actually implement this from the, the time we decided to do it because the systems to actually publish peer reviews where we're not up to, up to scratch to be able to do this automatically. And so this is a really important development that needs to be available to all journals. We need these technical standards and, and user-friendly transfer mechanisms between journals to facilitate this transfer of review. We need good attribution mechanisms to the reviewers for this credit. We need to have standards about um, uh, upfront agreements so that we don't need to recertify or re-ask permissions for publication. And finally, these um, interesting journal agnostic um, initiatives that are, that are starting up are basically suggesting that there are better standards that could be done in, in really focusing on the technical quality of review. So with thanks for your, um, uh, your um, attention, I will uh, now stop sharing and pass on to the next person. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much indeed, Veronique. Um, if you, anybody has any questions for Veronique, um, we'll take all of the questions at the end and just please type that into the chat box. 
Um, so now that we've got um, Alison, who's going to talk to us about credit. Alison, over to you. Thanks so much, Simon. And, and um, thanks to Veronique and all my co-presenters today and also um, to NISO as well as the Peer Review Week Steering Committee for putting this together. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so as Simon said, I'm Alison O'Connell. I'm one of the co-chairs, there are three of us uh, for credit. And um, I am also a consultant and I was first Oh, sorry, I'm getting that um, I first got involved with credit um, a few years ago when I was working um, for Airy Systems, the so creator's editorial manager. Um, but other than that, I've been in commercial publishing and software as a service for um, about 15 years now. So, um, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about what credit is. Um, however, you know, I'm used to giving overview presentations that get into a lot of detail about the taxonomy, and, and that's not actually what I'm going to do today. So forgive me if I go through it a little bit quick. And um, if you'd like more, like, granular information about the taxonomy, I'd be happy to follow up with anyone, you know, after this session. So what credit is, is um, essentially a taxonomy of 14 roles that and a set of best practice recommendations about how they should be applied to um, to make clear the specific contributions that every author or contributor to a manuscript makes. So, in other words, if you're listed as an author on a manuscript for um, you know published within a journal that has adopted credit, you will have one or more of these terms attached to your name, and that's um, you know being displayed along with the uh, version of the manuscript that's online, um, as well as being exported so that it's also machine readable. And so these are the 14 roles. And of course, I put uh, the URL to the credit website uh, at the bottom so that you can go in and you can see how these roles are defined you know, if you're not familiar. But I also wanted to point out that credit is now working with NISO. Um, and so NISO is helping us make credit a real standard and um, you know this has been going on for a few months but we've really picked up the pace in terms of you know having some um, having this website is obviously one tangible example but we've also um, been able to sort of set up some working groups as well as the steering group um, that the co-chairs sort of um, help to participate in so there's a lot going on there and we're really grateful for the support of NISO there. Um, and so, of course, by now you may be wondering what do contributor roles have to do with peer review? And, um, you know, so the answer, I think, and where I'm going to focus for the rest of this talk is on one single role. And so you can see I've highlighted it here on my screen. And so this is the role. It's called writing slash review and editing which differentiates it from another writing specific role within the taxonomy, which is, you know, to do with writing the original draft. So again, anybody who is um, contributing to the manuscript will have one or more of these roles. Individuals may both have the same role, you know, two folks may be participating to do data curation, for example. Um, and, and so that is true of any of the roles. But this specific writing, review and editing role is really all about pre-submission work to the manuscript. So um, these are the folks who are involved with, with reviewing the manuscript before it is submitted, before traditional peer review as we think of it begins. And so, um, you know, I think when we think about uh, making peer review more trustworthy and we say that, you know, having more granular information about the contributions that contributors make up front does this, I think using this writing, review and editing role and starting to think of peer review as, as starting even, you know, during the initial um, creation stage is important. And so I'm also going to talk about a few future possibilities that touch this peer review area of credit, or I should say where credit touches peer review and its expanded definition. Um, so the first is that there are initiatives underway to standardize um, peer review metadata. So I know STM has launched one such um, initiative to sort of create its own peer review taxonomy. 
Um, but, you know, some other, and that is separate today from credit. Um, it's just something that, you know, I'm, I'm watching with interest and I think others in this area are too. Um, and there is also the potential to leverage uh, the credit metadata, which is, you know, it's, it's going to be part of Crossref and it's um, including credit is also on the ORCID roadmap. So being able to see specifically what a contributor did for each publication in an ORCID record. Um, so being able to then leverage um, these metadata items to search for collaborators in a more, more specific way, or to find collaborators who have funding, for example, um, because as you saw when I showed the slide that had the 14 roles, there are, there are really specific contributions that are being tracked now, and so it will make searching um, really um, productive. And so the same could be said for um, reviewers as well. So once you have good information, for example, on who's doing the pre-submission review um, in a certain area consistently, you may wish to build out a really robust reviewer database that kind of leverages some of this. And it's all made possible because um, we now have, have this metadata. And um, of course, you know, initiatives like uh, ORCID peer review are all about recognizing the contributions of reviewers. And you can see how, you know, maybe um, there's some, some synergy there just with regard to granting recognition, leveraging credit. And I think some of the integrators um, are already doing this with regard to, um, you know, trying to incentivize the, um, the contributions that are made to manuscripts based on credit, um, if not review itself. And then also, um, and this sort of dovetails with something I read within the blog post that Veronique um, published uh, today, being able to use this data to help um, researchers advance their careers and to help them to really get the recognition um, that they deserve. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up and pass to Tony. Um, and so, yeah, if you, if you want more information about credit, the URL is there and I'd be happy to chat with you and I know uh, my co-chairs would as well. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Allison. Excellent. Okay. So thank you. Um, my name is Tony Alves. I'm the Director of Product Management at Aries Systems. I've been working in scholarly publishing. Um, well, this is probably my 30th year in scholarly publishing, and uh, I've been uh, working in manuscript submission systems for 20 years. Uh, I have a disclosure. Uh, you know, Aries Systems is a for-profit company, and we are a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, Elsevier um, and have been for the past two years. So let me tell you the, uh, the story of Mecca. Uh, in 2017, uh, John Sack uh, of Highwire uh, contacted various uh, of the major commercial submission systems uh, to talk about a common problem that, uh, that we all had. And that was uh, that uh, publishers were asking us to transfer manuscripts uh, between our systems because uh, believe it or not, uh, publishers uh, use different types of submission systems, different submission systems uh, within their uh, publishing program. And so uh, publishers don't just use Aries or just use Scholar One. Uh, they, they tend to have journals that use different systems. And so working uh, with Highwire uh, and their product uh, Benchpress, working with Clarivate and their product uh, I, uh, Scholar One, eJournal Press uh, and EJP, uh, Aries and editorial manager, and um, we also included uh, the Public Library of Science because at the time they were developing their own system. Uh, we, we got together to talk about uh, this issue, um, and it wasn't just that publishers wanted us to transfer papers between uh, uh, each other, uh, between journals. Uh, they, there was also a, a big call at the time for preprint servers to uh, provide uh, to provide a stream uh, an easy path for papers that were on preprint servers uh, and to push those to journals um, and also vice versa to be able to uh, push papers that were submitted to journals to preprint servers. So uh, we began to work on a project that um, 
uh, we uh, called the Manuscript Exchange Common Approach and uh, realized that in order to really get a, uh, a, um, a mass following or in, in order to really get this project off the ground, we needed to uh, extend and expand the project. And so we approached Mecca, uh, I'm sorry, NISO uh, in 2018, uh, and we uh, worked together, a working group that included a cross uh, section of uh, organizations, uh, society publishers, university presses, uh, other organizations. So you can see uh, the American Chemical Society, the American Physical Society, Cold Spring Harbor, eLife, IEEE, uh, Green 15 Consulting, JISC, the Journal of Clinical Investigation, the National Library of Medicine, uh, Springer Nature, Taylor and Francis. Um, so you can see it was well represented, along with uh, the, the originators of, of the project. So uh, one of the drivers of this project was that um, there really uh, is a need uh, in, uh, in research uh, to be able to move manuscripts and data about manuscripts around. Uh, and that is because uh, we want to reduce author frustration and we want to reduce reviewer frustration. So 85% of all papers uh, that get submitted by researchers get rejected and it's a real hassle to have to then take all of that material and try to resubmit it elsewhere. And uh, about 20% of all reviewers conduct about 80% of all reviews and reviewers can get really frustrated over the redundancy of the work that they might have to do um, and being asked to uh, review uh, papers that they've already seen. Uh, total uh, wasted time is uh, estimated to be about uh, 15 million hours. So I want to just review the use cases uh, again. Uh, the original use cases in our minds were being able to transfer manuscripts uh, between uh, peer review systems. And again, that is uh, for things like cascading workflows and uh, being able to uh, work uh, when, when journals work in a consortium where journals on the, that work uh, that publish on the same topic but are published by different publishers, they, they sometimes want to share papers uh, and move papers in between their systems. Uh, a, a, the second major use case was being able to transfer manuscripts uh, from preprint servers to journals and then also from uh, submitted papers that are submitted to journals, being able to push those to preprint servers as a service to authors. Uh, so some of the uh, secondary use cases were uh, being able to move papers from authoring systems uh, where authors collaborate, um, or, uh, systems like Overleaf, um, and some publishers have what they call author portals or researcher portals, being able to move papers from those authoring systems into peer review. Um, and then also being able to export manuscripts once they've been through peer review to things like repositories or compositors. Um, uh, other vendors. So uh, there was, uh, there are actually a lot of use cases for uh, the manuscript exchange common approach protocols. So I've talked a lot about the background. I've talked a lot about the use cases. What I want to do is really focus on what is manuscript exchange common approach. Um, it is a way to facilitate the transfer of files and data between publications and platforms. So it, it is a protocol, a defined protocol, a specification that outlines uh, what the rules are uh, to assemble files and data, package files and data, and push them to another system. And for a system to be able to receive that material and then create a, a submission uh, record in their system as well as a people record or a, a, a user record in a system. The uh, journals and authors set the rules. Uh, there is accommodations to allow authors and reviewers to give permission for transfer. The, um, uh, the journals decide how much information they're going to send and how much information they are going to receive. Um, the MECA protocol simply defines what could be in the package. Um, and how that package is put together. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
uh, one of our principles was to really produce a minimum viable product so that uh, to make it simple and easy for people to uh, adopt the adopt the protocols and we tried to use as many best practices and industry standards as possible so what is it what is it what is mecca not <laughs> uh, it's not a central service so the the package is not going to a central service which then distributes it out um, it's not a database there's nothing being stored it's really a it is really just a protocol that people can conform to in order to uh, send papers over the interwires uh, to other systems. Uh, there is a low barrier to entry that was important when we uh, were putting, when we were looking at standards and protocols. Um, and so our goal was to have wide adoption. The, I'm, I'm just gonna touch quickly on uh, some of the project areas. We uh, discussed uh, vocabulary. We agreed on standard nomenclature. Uh, so we'd have a baseline understanding of, uh, of what the protocol, how the protocols would be written. Uh, the packaging, uh, that was all about how we uh, package up the XML files and the source files that are all part of the package, uh, the Mecca package. Um, we chose to, uh, uh, to go with uh, a very common technology, uh, uh, just zipping them up. Um, uh, we identify. We 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 put together what the identity, how people would identify themselves, uh, the identity of the article itself, so that when you moved the article from publisher to publisher, people would know whether or not they received that article in the past. Uh, identified how it was going to be transmitted, um, the protocols for processing the data and files, security, that sort of thing. Um, the article metadata conforms to JATS. Uh, it conforms to the JATS Green DTD. Um, and um, so we defined the DTD, the schema that um, uh, using JATS that would package, that, that would identify what the article was about, um, the title, the author, the abstract, all of that sort of thing. We identified a schema for identifying um, how the, what was going to be transferred, the protocols for pushing um, the, the files and data out. And one of the really unique things that we did was we defined a schema for the reviews themselves so that we could, um, so that uh, a, a publisher could uh, put the review information into an XML document, into an XML format, and anybody would then be able to read that review information. And, and that schema could contain multiple versions of reviews. So review of the original submission, review of revision one, review of revision two. So there were quite a lot of project areas. Uh, that it was a, a, um, a, an interesting and exciting two years as uh, that group that I mentioned earlier, uh, the commercial publishers, the society publishers, the university presses, and the other organizations that work in, in scholarly publishing. Uh, we all came to an agreement on what those schemas would look like, what that XML files would look like, what, um, all, how all of that would transfer. Um, and the uh, the specification was published uh, in tw uh, this earlier this year as a recommended practice by NISO, um, and we are currently forming a standing committee so that we can continue the work on Mecca, uh, modernize some of it, looking at things like an API rather than a um, uh, an FTP zip file. And there, and there are links here where you can uh, get more information as well as access to the actual uh, recommended practice. So I'd like to turn it over to uh, one of my uh, Mecca associates, um, Melissa Harrison, who's going to talk about uh, JATS 4R. Thank you for um, the other speakers. It was really interesting as I was listening to because there's, there's kind of so much overlap in, in what we're all um, doing and working on. So I'm here to talk about JATS 4R which is about which is a, a working group uh, called JATS for R, but it's JATS for reuse. And this um, week we uh, published a peer review materials recommendation for public comment. So, um, so just to give a brief introduction as to what JATS for R is, it's is a voluntary working group, um, and we're devoted to optimizing the reusability of scholarly content. So basically, it's about the plumbings. 
So um, we've, we've heard from Veronique about, um, you know, peer review and how important it is and, you know, the need for openness um, and from Alison about credit for, for this work. Um, and then also from Tony about exchanging this material before it's published. So Jatswara is kind of at the very other end of it. And when peer reviews are published, what we, our aim is to try and make sure that everything is tagged up using the JATS XML um, DTD so that it's reusable and mineable and um, so that everybody's doing the same thing. So um, JATS for R is also a NISO working group, uh, recommended practices, and we, we've got 17 recommendations that we've published so far. One of them is um, on the credit taxonomy. And, and how to um, tag that up in your XML. And it's uh, run by a steering group of um, seven people from various arms of, of publishing. <clears throat> so I just wanted to give a little plug because this, this week um, we launched a, a new website um, at the same time as um, the releasing our peer review materials, um, all in time for peer review week. So the, the peer reviews uh, materials recommendation, um, there was a, a meeting held in London in July of 2018. So <laughs> these things take a long time to work on. And we, we knew that um, there was much more and more interest in this. And the work of the Jats Var group often is to try and get to um, new things that are happening in publishing before the horse is bolted in a way because we've got a few recommendations on, on issues like how you tag authors and affiliations and where things are so established and well entrenched within people's systems it's much harder to get them to potentially change um, uh, the way things are done so with peer review materials what we wanted to do is get a recommendation together so that people could start following this as they started to, to publish their peer reviews. So there was that, the working um, group, the, the meeting that was held in London, and then we published a, a paper on F1000 in October 2018. And then it wasn't until the 11th of April 2019 that the, um, the JATSRAR working groups uh, formed. And we were working on this recommendation for over a year. You know, we had 29 one hour meetings and there was work in between. And we had um, a core team, um, including someone from PLOS who put lots of input into this. And then as, as things were moving along, we had special guest input. So for instance, Publons, we, um, they came along to explain how their process works and review commons and also Crossref. So all the people that are interacting with journal publishers um, in order to publish peer reviews. So what we came up with um, was a set of um, minimal requirements. So if you are going to publish your peer review um, and you want to use the JATS XML schema, then these are the minimal things that, that they need to um, include. There was a, a lot of work that went into this and this list looks quite short, but obviously there, was, there were more things that um, we did um, uh, discuss and uh, afterwards. But basically, it, the uh, recommendation shows people um, how they should link their peer reviews to the article they're passing comment on and how to publish them, whether they're a component of an article or a separate document, um, indicating what, what the document actually is, whether it's a review, editor feedback or, or an author comment, and listing out the authors, indicating the published date and, and um, that they must have a DOI. So, I mean, that seems quite straightforward, but there is a lot of complexity in, in this. So, for instance, you know, whether you publish it as a component of an article or a separate document, traditionally, publishers, when they're linking content together, they're published on the same system. But as uh, Veronique uh, mentioned, you know, there's review comments and there are all these different methods of, of how uh, public, how um, peer reviews are being used and passed around between publishers now that adds complexity to this. So the extended recommendations. So we, we realised that some publishers starting out will want to keep it really simple. Um, but then there are, we were trying to anticipate other things. So like, for instance, people might want to publish additional dates relating to the peer review process. Now, in Mecca, we worked um, with Mecca as far as we could. But these sorts of dates are really critical. But people might not want to publish them. But people might want to, so we wanted to provide that additional information, as well as you know whether 
the um, peer reviews, what the process was, whether they were single blind, double blind, triple blind, you know, what the revision around was, what the recommendation was, and also additional author information such as ORCIDs, institutions, conflicts of interest. Now, we didn't mention credit here because at the moment, um, uh, roles specific to peer review aren't, aren't um, within credit, but I realised that that might be kind of a future thing. And also, um, transfer details. So if, if a peer review was transferred from another journal and someone wants to publish that information, then it's, um, it's available. And also, again, JATS Ferrar is, a, is about um, machine readability uh, across corpuses. So if everyone's tagging things in the same way, it means that much more information can be um, garnered from a larger pool of uh, peer review materials if it's all open. So um, again, as was mentioned earlier, like peer review and one of the criticism is it being a, a closed box. So JATS for All works in the open. So all of the material that was linked to this, this um, corpus of work to create the recommendation is all, um, so we, we have a Google Drive that has all the meeting minutes, um, we have all the calls, they're all recorded and, and available online. So, so my last slide is just a, a, a call to action. So as a voluntary um, working group, it, you know, it, it's quite difficult sometimes getting people involved, but um, we, we don't work without input from the community. So again, everything is peer reviewed. So um, a, a subgroup works on a recommendation, um, does all the groundwork, um, gets it to a point where it's ready, then it gets reviewed by the steering committee, and then it goes out for public comment. And so the, the peer review materials recommendation is currently out for public comment until um, the 30th of October, where we'll be getting input from anyone who, who's got any comments on it. And then after that, it will go back to the subgroup to, um, to make any changes or, or whatever is required. But um, but that's basically kind of an introduction to JATS for R. Take a look at the new website, um, but also this important recommendation. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Melissa. So uh, thank you for everyone on our panel today for those really interesting presentations. Um, and we're bang on time. We've got 10 minutes left for, for questions. So firstly, um, I've got a question uh, from Matt. Reading, let me just find it. Um, here we go. So this is a question from Veronique. Uh, so Matt says, with publishing peer reviews, have there been any issues with problematic content in them? For instance, reviews which break blinding or have inflammatory comments. I think that's break blinding, uh, blind peer review or have inflammatory comments. At our journal, the editors will redact such elements before passing them on to the authors. So have you got a comment on that, Veronique? Yeah, so we, the way we've, we've implemented it is, is um, uh, very much like uh, Melissa just described as well, where we actually have the, uh, all the history of the peer review, including the um, decision letters, uh, the editorial decision letters with the reviews that are sent to authors. So, you know, if you were to, to uh, adopt that system in your journal, any, any changes that have been made by the editors uh, uh, would would also um, uh, translate to what is published on, on the website. Basically, what we publish in terms of the, the peer review history is what the authors see, as well as their responses, point by point responses, and, and so on. Uh, we do have an option in the system to for editor or staff to stop the publication in in extraordinary cases, such as you know, copyrighted material that is included in a review or things like that. And uh, that may not have been seen by um, or, or, or realized by the editors or the reviewers. And we've only um, uh, used that, that option on about a dozen times out of 6,000 um, uh, peer review history that we've published. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from uh, Elena Rigley. And this is a question for Alison. Um, she says, how is the writing, review and editing role envisaged for blind or anonymous peer review in publishing workflows or peer review metadata? Is there movement to encourage adoption of credit metadata by peer review recognition entities, e.g. publons? Alison, can you answer that? 
Yeah, sure. So it's a really great question. Um, and this is something that I've just started to think about myself. Um, so I think with the 14 roles, including the writing, review, and editing role, these are still, in terms of the best practices, they are still recommendations that are really to do with art, you know, like the, the original authoring or um, work to do with, with the article itself itself and not specifically with peer review. Um, so when it comes to the pre-submission review, um, that's sort of the use case that, that we were exploring. With regard to, you know, whether or not um, other, you know, publons like entities are um, integrating credit or thinking about, you know, credit specific metadata or anything like that. I can't really speak uh, to that. I don't know if anyone here is, is with Publons, but um, like I, I highlighted, I think, you know, ORCID with regard to ORCID peer review, maybe that would be a natural um, first, you know, use case just where we're sort of already on the roadmap and we're, we're um, sort of already working together, but I'm not quite sure what, what plans Publons may have. It's a good question. Okay, I, I don't think we have anyone from Publons um, here, but um, maybe we can follow up on that later. Um, the, the final question we had is from, from Bill Kasdorf, who, and this is specifically for Melissa, and he asked if you had any comments on the use of, of RAW. Uh, as in the, the Crossref, um, the institution schema, I'm assuming, is that what we're talking about with RAW? ROR, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, yeah, no, no specific comments. Um, I think that um, at some point, as it becomes more well established, that, that Jax Ra will come up with a recommendation for that as, as well. Um, but it's, uh, I'm aware that a few people are using it thus far, but um, we, we will be looking at that as well. But I, I think, generally speaking, it should be quite straightforward to to use the the attributes available in in jats anyway to to um use that taxonomy okay uh, great we actually have another question uh, this is out for tony um maybe they thought he was going to feel left out but we've got one for him so this is specifically about mecca um okay this has got lots of acronyms in it have non-profit or open source manuscript submission systems e.g PKP, Public Knowledge Projects, or OJS, Janeway, et cetera, being consulted in the past about joining the Mecca efforts, or will they be invited to do so now? Um, yes, they have been invited to, to join. Um, we have uh, a number of, um, uh, we've uh, extended an invitation to COCO, we've extended an invitation to OJS, um, and there may be another one in there that I can't recall um but uh, as we put together as we've been putting together the standing committee we've uh um, have been pulling as many of the um uh, submission systems in as we can um or um you know you may not always we may not always think of them as submission systems they uh, some of them are more hybrid publishing systems that also manage peer review so uh yes we have been talking to um ojs which is P, uh, pkp yeah um and, and, and a few others. Okay. Okay, great. So watch this space. Yeah. Um, and we do have a question. There's a question that was posed from Michael Willis that Alison very kindly has answered, but I don't know if anybody else would like to um, comment as well. Um, have the JATS for R and STM peer review taxonomy groups shared information in reaching their recommendations? So, sorry, the, the JATS for R working group, have we shared? information in reaching their recommendations so the recommendation is out for public comment currently right. um, and that all the history is on on uh, the slides for uh, this presentation will be made available won't they so um all the links to all the information that led us to those conclusions are there but um it's out for public comment at the moment so we would like any and every comment to be made on it please thank you okay that's great. So that's, um, I think that's it. Um, and again, we're right just under time, just a couple of minutes less, so perhaps that's a good time to leave it. Um, so finally, I'd like to thank um, everybody, all the panelists for, for taking part today. And thank you for everyone to, who's dialed in. Um, so we've made a recording 
and um, we're going to put the recording, I think we'll be able to um, edit it, um, put it on the Peer Review Week YouTube channel, and we're also going to be able to put it um, on the, the Cabell's uh, webinar page alongside with the presentations um, and make those available for everyone. And we'll email everybody afterwards to, to let everyone know, everyone know the links to those resources. So thanks again to everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of Peer Review Week. Thank you very much.